All right, welcome to part five of my examination of Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the textbooks. I got it right for the very first time, by the way. Um, I guess I'll get started. Occasionally, you'll find an evolutionist that will try to tell you that a virus is the missing link between non-life and the first cell. But a living cell is an extremely complex chemical factory that's capable of many various functions, including reproducing itself. A virus has no ability to reproduce itself. It could not have been there first. Hey, I'd like to see one example of, of an evolutionist occasionally claiming that a virus is a missing link between life and non-life, um, as, in a, as in, in a chain from something evolving to life or whatever you're trying to say here. Um, now, when it comes to organizational grade, they fall into that category. They fall into that realm of where the line between um, abiotic and biotic becomes kind of fuzzy. There's a whole bunch of other things outside of viruses, n naked RNA molecules that are able to replicate, that kind of thing, um, that are also in that category. Uh, none of which are looked at as, this must be the, you know, here, here's the or first living thing, or here's the first proto-living thing. Um, so I think you're... you're you're either not understanding or misrepresenting that that point about viruses. Now, um, I did see a newspaper article about what a couple of years ago about the Mimi virus, saying that Mimi virus is missing link between living and non-living, or something like that. Um, that was a newspaper article, and the scientists themselves that studied it said, "We're no, this is far from any kind of missing link." I mean, so the article, the headline itself, um, went against what the actual scientists researching it claimed. So. Your kids in school today are going to be taught that scientists have been able to come close to creating life in the lab. But when you look at these experiments, if you look closely enough, you'll find that they have come nowhere near overcoming the law of biogenesis and creating life from non-life in the labs. They've been able to come up with some non-living chemical compounds that are found in living matter. It would be like you and I creating calcium, and since calcium is found in people, announcing to the world that we've created a human being. Well, they've come nowhere near creating life in the labs. The law of biogenesis has never been known to have been overcome. Oh, yes, the Uri Miller experiment. Isn't that fun? Uh, the, okay, I'm going to get into this in a little bit of tedious detail. I apologize in advance, uh, but I think it has to be covered. Uh, I think it's really interesting that whenever discussing, you know, supposed flaws in abiogenesis, uh, creationists like to bring up the Uri Miller experiment. And um, they always say the same thing. I mean, really, you guys really should maybe read some original material instead of actually just cut and pasting your own sources from each other. You might actually make a better argument if you did that. Uh, but anyway, Uri Miller. So, uh, the big creationist claim about this, and this is made all over the place, not just, I'm not picking on Russ for making it, it's made by just about everybody, um, so I think I, way back to Henry Morris. The claim is made that, you know, um, Uri Miller, the Uri Miller experiment took a supposed Earth atmosphere, sparked it, got a couple of organic chemicals out of the mix. They made the claim that they'd created life in the laboratory. Um, that's, that's, that's the creationist version of the story, um, but then they show how the experiment was a failure, that, that the atmosphere was all wrong, that they had to separate the chemicals out. If they didn't, it was they were immediately destroyed, um, therefore proving that they not only didn't create life, they created a couple of compounds that weren't very important, um, and that was it. Uh, now, what's funny about this is that, first of all... <laughs> Um, Uri Miller experiment was not a failure, okay? They weren't attempting to create life. They didn't think that they were going to get an amoeba at the other end of this test tube when they were done. That was never the intention of the experiment. That wasn't the intent of the experimenters, okay? You have to look at it in context. Prior to the Uri Miller experiment, um, mostly, put it that way, uh, general attitude was, the general opinion was, or a common opinion was, how about that, was that amino acids, which were known, abiotically known, amino acids were known to have been created abiotically like they're found in meteorites. 
Uh, so the hypothesis was proposed that perhaps amino acids could not be created by normal chemistry, abiotic chemistry on Earth. I mean, now we know that, that life processes create them, but it was thought, you know, no norm, normal chemical processes could produce them. Now we could sit around in a laboratory and th synthesize them. That's easy. But that wasn't the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was to say, well, let's just take what we think the early Earth's atmosphere was like and see, and see if in this complex chemistry that amino acids could possibly be created. Um, that was the point of the experiment, and it was a success. Now, it turned out right afterwards, um, other experimenters looking at it said, well, your atmosphere was off. We'll just change the atmosphere. Um, the point of that being that, you know what, after 1953... This is the this is something that you creationists seem to not know. After 1953, we didn't just say, "Well, that was a great job. We created life in the laboratory. Let's go on. You know, let's never look at that again." Um, as if somehow Miller Urey was where that research ended. That was the that was it. We we hit the brick wall and we just quit at that point in time. And um, we've just gone on re recycling that old story in all of our textbooks it's mentioned in textbooks because it was a it was it was landmark it was important it was big but afterwards and pretty much continuously after that point in time thousands of experiments have been done and the result of those experiments every single component not only every single amino acid but every single component found in living things in living cells everything that we know that life can produce we've shown can be produced abiotically. All of the important components, all the important basal components, let's put it that way, can be created abiotically using conditions that are known to exist. Okay, this is that's what's kind of important. This isn't just sitting around with some complex laboratory equipment and making it. That's easy. We can make anything that way. That doesn't mean squat. We're looking at it from the perspective. Scientists are looking at it saying, okay, let's, let's say, you know, we know that this mix of chemicals is found in volcanic pools. What happens if we do this to it? And they go, well, look at that. Nucleotides form. Um, or look at that. Phospholipid membranes form. This kind of thing. We know that's what the point of these experiments are. We're not trying to create life. We're trying to show that the building blocks of life all occur naturally and normally under conditions that we know to exist on Earth. Secular humanists try to convince us that if the various parts of a living organism could be intelligently engineered by human scientists in labs, that that would somehow prove that life could have started all on its own. But if they ever even got to the point of creating life in the labs, and they're nowhere close to that at this time, all this would prove is that it takes massive amounts of intelligent design to be able to create life from non-life. Again, and I know this is a continuous theme throughout my response to your video, um, but again, I'm not sure if you don't understand this material or if you're deliberately misrepresenting it. Uh, this is kind of back to what I said before, or relates directly to what I said before. Creating these compounds in the laboratory, under laboratory conditions, under completely known to be synthetic conditions, doesn't prove a thing. Um, okay, if we set up massive complex equipment and very very complicated experiments that have no counterpart in nature and we produce life yes we've proven that life can be created through intelligent means but that's not the goal of experiments in abiogenesis the goal of abiogenesis is to duplicate conditions that we know occur naturally and then see what kind of complex chemistry can arise from those conditions by saying by by making the claim that you made you're misrepresenting the work of a lot of great scientists out there um that's that's lying russ lying remember you were really offended when i called you a liar or you know that's the kind of thing that that gets that, that word attached to you when you make the claim like that um by the way just just for shits and giggles you know that uh life has been created in the laboratory a a living working cell utilizing synthetic dna completely synthetic genes has been produced now that experiment does not in any way nor was it ever claimed to be you know look we've created we've created life with synthetic G dna therefore life evolved naturally that wasn't the goal of that experiment um no that's not 
that experiment is not linked to nor critical to studies in abiogenesis. Okay, you, you, hopefully you see the difference there. Um, just a uh, this can be long here. I apologize, but an analogy I'd like to look at it is um, that hopefully maybe you'll understand is if you look at, okay, think of a crime scene investigation. Let's just say, I just imagine this, a, a crime scene, a man has a horseshoe-shaped dent in his forehead, and his wife and best friend are claiming that he was playing horseshoes, and the horseshoe ricocheted off a tree, bounced back, hit him in the forehead, and killed him. Okay? That's what the, that's what the witnesses are claiming happened. Now, the police, of course, are suspicious. They think, I don't think that that's possible. I think that you guys walked up to him and whapped him in the head with the horseshoe. Right, you sort of see what. So what they would do in this case is they would try to duplicate the they would try to duplicate the conditions and see if it's possible. Okay, and so let's just say that the that the defense attorney, who's you know defending the wife or the best friend, um, does a series of experiments where they 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 fling a horseshoe at a tree and measure how fast it bounces back and are able to demonstrate that a horseshoe could bounce back with enough velocity to to kill a person, right? They show in court, they're, they're ready to show in court that this is this situation is possible. They're not saying this is how it happened, but they're saying, look, the story is not completely implausible. Here's a possible scenario by which it could happen. Therefore, invalidating the, the, the prosecutor who's saying that's completely impossible. The prosecutor's story is, Nope, he had to have been murdered because there's no way a horseshoe could bounce back by hitting a tree. The defense goes, no, look. And they show a video of an experiment they did where they say, look, the horseshoe bounced back with enough velocity to kill him. So therefore, the prosecutor's case is thrown out, um, not because the prosecutors are 100% wrong, but because they're wrong by saying that it's impossible. And I hope that made sense. Likewise, um, those who doubt that life had a either a terrestrial origin or had a naturalistic origin, those who doubt that are saying, you can't no, there's no possible abiotic chemical process that can produce a nucleotide. And scientists are going, well, you know, if we, you know, formic acid, uh, uh, formaldehydes are common. Um, in, we know that they're common in a wide variety of abiotically produced conditions. Um, if, if, if they're allowed to evaporate under these conditions, well, I think that I believe it's sulfur. I'm not positive about that. Um, what, what do you know? Nucleotides form. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. I think it's in the process, in the presence of sugars and sulfur. I'm not, I'm not, the chemistry isn't important. Um, but understand that the scientists are saying, look, under this condition, which we know to occur naturally, nucleotides form. Therefore, they're not saying that's how nucleotides formed. We're not saying we've proved that nucleotides are abiotic in origin and, you know, whatever. But what they're saying is, is they're invalidating the, their, uh, their opponent's argument that says that it's impossible. They said, no, it's not impossible. It is possible. Here's a mechanism why. And with all of those components of life, we don't just have one. We have, here's, here's one possible way, here's another possible way, and here's another possible way. Um, maybe all three were important, maybe one of them, maybe none of them were actually how it happened. Maybe there's a fourth way we haven't discovered yet how it happened. But anyway, by showing that it's possible, we've deflated the argument that says that it could not have happened. That's the importance of the experiments looking at abiogenesis. And none of your distortions or fabrications change that fact. The DNA chromosome is the most complex molecule in the universe. Careful with your words, Russ. Uh, their DNA chromosome isn't a molecule. DNA is a molecule. Uh, chromosome is uh, DNA wrapped around histones uh, bound further into a chromosome. Uh, it's not a molecule itself, just so you know. One mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds of one DNA arranging itself in a natural setting to be 1 in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, then aren't we lucky that nobody claims that DNA self-assembles um, from um, randomly assorted component parts?